Welcome back, welcome back. I'm joined today by a best-selling writer whose own life reads like one of his novels. A star athlete in his youth, he's served five years in the House of Commons, 14 in the House of Lords, and two at Her Majesty's pleasure. In the middle of all that, at 34, faced with financial problems, he sat down and wrote a bestseller and has had a successful career, incredibly. How many novels is it now? 14. And you saw that face there, and you realised, <laughs> all around the world, Bestseller everywhere. Geoffrey Arch is here. And I want to talk in a moment about Prisoner of Birth. But first of all, very good to see you. Love to see you too, David. And today is actually publication You're on day. On publication day. Who uh, could I choose to be with on publication exactly, day? Exactly. It was a right choice. A right <laughs> choice. And what, and what is special to you about this book? I've heard that you think it's your best yet. Uh, the critics are saying it's as good as Cain and Abel or better than Cain and Abel. Of course, that's a long time ago. I, I, I found this fascinating story in the sense that... Uh, it's really an attempt to write a modern Count of Monte Cristo. It's the story of a man called Danny Cotchwright, born in the east end of London, takes his girlfriend up to the west end to propose to her, asks her to be his wife, and he gets involved in a brawl which has nothing to do with him, and he's arrested when his closest friend is, is killed. He's arrested for his murder. You see the trial, and he's convicted for a, to a 22-year sentence for a murder he didn't commit. And he's thrown into the toughest prison in England, Belmarsh, where I spent three weeks of my life. And he escapes. No one has ever escaped from Belmarsh. He escapes from Belmarsh and gets revenge on the four people who put him there. It's a simple enough story, but the fun, I had terrific fun in writing it. And at the same time, experience like the Belmarsh experiences. Yes, because one, yeah, one was able to, if, I mean, you, you see a series about prisons and you read books about prisons. The truth is it's very different. It's very boring at, at most levels. You're locked up in a cell for 22 hours, which is a half the size of this, this room that we're in with three other people sometimes. So it's very boring. And, and Danny is locked up with a, a Nicholas Moncrief and Big Al, which changes his whole life. Well, if he'd been in the next cell, it could have been completely different. The two people he ends up with change his whole life and indeed make it possible for him to escape. Have you, in fact, kept in touch with any of the people you've got to know in prison? Two of the murderers. One of the fascinating things in the acknowledgments, David, is you will see there, there's an acknowledgement to a, a, a man who uh, I met in Belmarsh, a Glaswegian who has a 22-year sentence for murder, and he couldn't read and write. Uh, here, and I had the great honour a few weeks ago of going to his degree ceremony for a BSc. He now has three diplomas and two degrees and is considering doing a PhD. So a lot of his character gets into the book because I saw this uneducated man with clearly a good brain, didn't have the advantages in life we had, you going to Cambridge, me going to Oxford, never had that advantage, no education at all, left school at 13. But the boy's got three diplomas and two degrees, which we haven't got. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And yours, your story, I mean, the, the people always say that the stories for novels or books or whatever, it needs to be a roller coaster. Yes. And in a way, your life has classically been that, the rise, the sort of fall with the prison mm -hmm. and so on, mm -hmm. and now rising again. What gave you the strength to rise again, and what was the most important lesson you learned from your two years in prison? Well, if I hadn't risen again, you collapsed, so you, you've won choice or the other. The most important lesson I learnt was how privileged and lucky I had been and am. I, uh, I mean, we've known each other. I, uh, you interviewed me when I was 21, and you were the brightest young star on television at the time. I remember. Both so we've of us known each still other. The same, really. We've, yeah. <laughs> we've known each other over 40 years, and we've had a very middle-class, very privileged life. Kit came to see me just before he was leaving. The day before he was leaving in one of the prisons, and he said, I'll swap places with you. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm 23 years old, I'll be 61. I'll come out of prison with a wife and family waiting there to greet me, with a job to go to, a lovely home to live in, and 20 pleasant years ahead of me. I'll give you that if you'll change places with me. What will I get, I said. He said, I'm 23 years old, I have no family, I have no one to go to, I will get 40 pounds when I go out, and I'm on heroin, and I can't crack it. He died two years later, found under a hedge in Boston. So when you say, David, what did you learn? I learned how bloody lucky I am mm. to have had the life I have and the privileges of life I had. And to see that kid, he was a good-looking kid, had, in theory, didn't have to go down that lane. I, God knows how he ended up like that. But he did, 
and that's what he said. So yes, the answer to your question is, I learnt you've been very lucky, Geoffrey. Mm. And with that sense of blessing and so on, do you have any regrets about your life so far? I think one's foolish to have regrets, because you get one life, you get one crack at it. If you stand still and say, I made this terrible mistake, and I'm, and I'm going to sit still for another five years and regret it, I think you've got to admit you've made the mistake and then go forward. And, and my redemption in that sense was writing three prison diaries, which got the best critics I've ever had in my life, and then coming out and going back to the novel writing and spending all my energy on A Prisoner of Birth, getting everything into that. So that was, you very kindly said, and now you're back, and it's very, uh, very good. Mind you, I might say, while I'm on the screen with you, David, you were a classic example. You personally were a classic example of someone who never wavered. I never lost you as a friend. Uh, you're, I remember coming out of prison, and your invitation to your party was on my desk. That's and right. And that was two weeks after I'd come out of prison, I attended uh, your you, party. You paid whatever debts people no, said I you was, had. No, I was delighted that, to have been involved. I remember everyone who stood by me, and people were loyal, and people were good. But I remember coming out and looking on my desk, and there was your invitation to your party. That's right. <laughs> and uh, you write rather longer things than invitations. You write books, <laughs> but that's very sweet of you to remember that. The, uh, in fact, looking ahead, what are, what are the ambitions left? Well, they're more, not, of, more of the same? They're not political in that sense. I love doing my auctions, of which, of course, you've attended occasionally. I, I love doing my charity auctions. They're, they're such fun. And I'm now getting more invitations to speak and do charity auctions all over the world than I've ever had before. And yes, I know what the next book is. And the energy is going into the writing. And I, I think I've never been more relaxed or more content in my life. There's an irony, of course, at the moment in the fact that there's an election going on uh, for mayor of London, and mm. that was that was what you were. I'd love to have been mayor of London. To, poised to do. I'd love to have been mayor of London, but you and I'd be much more fascinated by the election that's going on in the United oh, States. Uh, and I this mean, is a man who's most... fascinated by America. Who are you backing? Well, I wanted Edwards to be a prime minister. Uh, to prime minister, I wanted Edwards to be uh, president. He was my first choice. I would now like Obama, but I'm bound to say I would like selfishly something that's totally different, David, and so would you. I'd like them to get to the convention floor with no candidate, because not since Roosevelt have we had a, an election on the floor. And the, uh, the author in me says, but if they don't pass the 2,100 votes they require, delegate votes they require, to become the candidate for the Democratic Party, and they have to start voting on the floor, that could become fascinating. The, or the stuff of another Jeffrey Archie novel. Yes, it's could. very dramatic. <laughs> well, good luck with this one. Thank you very much. Very good to see you. You too. Jeffrey yeah. Archer, his latest book out today. And in fact, he's talking there about talking there about America and the elections there. That's precisely what we're going to come to next. The latest news on the great race, the democratic race. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. We'll be back in a second.